Hi, I'm Tom Long, inviting you to join me hanging out in my little island paradise and discussing how the Bible relates to what our lives can become. I grew up paddling a canoe on a large lake near our town and on rivers all over the state of West Virginia. When I first moved to the island, I took a little surf canoe for a recreational paddle. I headed out from our house, paddling toward the Ocean Crest Pier about a mile away. It was a lovely, calm day, and I was enjoying this blissful outdoor communing with nature. I made it about a third of the way to the pier when the wind kicked up, an offshore wind. I tried to fight it to correct my course to allow for windage, but my bearing became increasingly southward toward the Bahamas. I turned directly north toward our south-facing beach, and although already tired, I paddled furiously in a near panic for the beach. To tell you the truth, this experience scared the bejeebers out of me. I don't really know what bejeebers are, but the way my dad used to say it, I know it's a bad thing to have scared out of you. I finally arrived on land completely spent. I'm sure people living near the Sea of Galilee grew up hearing many stories of those who perished on the water, just as those living in the coastal Carolinas hear such reports in the news on a too frequent basis. So I'm sure the fear of the disciples was real as they found themselves in a boat, distant from the shore, buffeted by waves and with the wind preventing them from making it to shore. That literal situation is scary, and it's also a picture of the life situation in which many of us find ourselves. We can resonate with Bob Seeger's song, Against the Wind, you know it. Against the wind, I'm still running against the wind. I'm older now, but still running against the wind. I can just hear his voice in my head. The disciples were alone through the night until the darkness just before the dawn. Now, the night before this, Jesus had used a boat, possibly the same boat in which the disciples were now stranded. Jesus had used a boat as a retreat to process the death of his friend, John the Baptist. Then a crowd found him and Jesus reacted the, the way he always did. He had compassion on them and spent the rest of the day healing the sick. At the end of the day, he performed the miracle of multiplying the loaves and the fishes to feed thousands. After the disciples had been sent off in the boat, Jesus sent the crowds away and went up on a mountain alone to pray. He prayed through the night. I called my childhood best friend yesterday to wish her a happy birthday. She's just concluding a cross country tour going all the way to Alaska with her adult daughter. For her birthday, her husband went to Akron, Ohio, where he met them, took her to a birthday dinner, and then over the next few hours drove them the rest of the way home. In a rain that was coming down on the car, so hard they could barely hear me speaking on the phone. Why did he come to them in the storm? Love. I like to think that's why Jesus, just before sunup, went to be with the disciples. And of course, he famously did this by walking to them on the water. But as he approached their boat, they took him to be a ghost. Now, according to Job chapter 9, verse 8, God is the only one who has ever walked on water. But their fear caused them not to see God in Christ, but to see a ghost on the water. When Jesus is near enough, that they can hear his voice above the wind and the seas, he says to them, take courage, don't be afraid. Recognizing their fear and offering them courage. He offers them courage by telling them who he is. The NIV translates the Greek, it is I. But it is also the exact same Greek expression that their Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, used to translate the Hebrew in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where God told Moses that his name was, I am. So Jesus is both saying, it is I, Jesus, and by walking to them on water and using the name, I am, he is also saying, it is I, God. 
What is the antidote to fear? Seeing Jesus for who he is, the compassionate God with divine authority over all creation. How did the disciples respond? 11 of the 12 look at one another, maybe even saying under the breath, that's cool. And just staying right where they are. But then there's Peter. Just as love had drawn Jesus out on the water to the disciples, Peter's love for Jesus makes him want to come to Jesus like two old friends running to hug each other when they first catch sight of one another in an airport. And Jesus lets Peter come. Peter's almost comical in his extremes. He reaches the heights of faith, turning his back on a successful business to follow Jesus. The first of the 12 to declare Jesus is Messiah. Preaching the first sermon in the history of the post-resurrection church and winning thousands of people to faith. But Peter also tried to talk Jesus out of the way of the cross. Peter denied he even knew Jesus three times. I think Jesus knew that Peter would sink, but Jesus let him come anyway. While love drew Peter from the boat to the water, what caused Peter to sink? The Bible says that he shifted his focus from Jesus to the wind whipping the waves and love gave way to fear. Peter had love, but it was not yet that perfect fullness of love that completely casts out fear. But even as he is on his way down, he knew Jesus was the one who could and would snatch him up to safety. So he cried out for help. Jesus helps Peter. He explains that Peter's little faith had allowed fear to create doubt. Fear creates doubt just as surely as love opens the door to faith. Was it a fear of failure that kept the other 11 in the boat? Could that be why Peter alone among them became so prominent in the book of Acts as he built the church? I think love and faith are almost like a muscle. They must be exercised if they are to grow. Failure, falling, and sinking are a part of living and growing. While Peter did give up on Jesus for a season, Jesus never gave up on Peter. Flailing, failing, sinking, fearing, doubting Peter ultimately lived into his name, the rock, because he kept on keeping on. Are you in the storm? Are you content with your seat in the boat? You love Jesus, but not enough to go to him in your scary, hard situation. Fear not, he will come to you. But tell the hotel manager in the movie, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, quoted an old saying, everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it is not yet the end. <clears throat> but what fruit will your life bear? Will you miss out on the greatness that God could have worked in you and through you because you were afraid to exercise the love and faith you already have so that it could grow into something more? The church can be a boat where we sit on our hands in the pews, quietly waiting for Jesus to call us home, or our faith walk can draw us out onto the water where God can perform the miracle of his love and grace, working through us to reach the world with the gospel. Has love cast out fear and called you out of the boat? Has faith lifted you to bear fruit beyond mere human capabilities? Are you willing to fail in order to grow? Lord, make us all Peters, giving love and faith room to grow, not just in spite of our failures, but because we dared to fail, trusting your love and faithfulness to lift us back up and make us even stronger. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When 
the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me.